Thank you. Thank you very much. Let us see some hands. How many of you would like to go to Mars? I see a good bunch of you. What if I told you that Mars is several hundred million kilometers away? It would take you at least six months to get there. Still takers? That didn't scare you a lot. What if I told you the surface of Mars has an average temperature of minus 60 degrees Celsius? Still takers? Great, great to hear. But what then if I told you the only way you could go was if you gave up the life you have here on Earth now forever? Still takers? That's pretty good to see. We still have takers. We have fewer, but we have takers. That's nice to hear. That could actually become the reality for, in, in, in as little as 10 years, for four prospective colonists. The project is called Mars One. It was established in 2011 by a, a couple of Dutch guys. In 2013, they opened up applications for a one-way trip to Mars. At that point, about 200,000 people expressed interest in taking that trip. 200,000 people. That's a lot of people. Granted, many of them didn't know what Mars had in store for them. They quit at no larger obstacles than uh, answering a questionnaire online and uh, uploading a video. But still, 200,000 people they expressed interest in just leaving their life here on Earth. Everyone knew that was what it was about, right from the start. So why would you do that? I will give you my perspective on that question later in this talk. But first, I would like to take you on a journey, starting with an idea, traveling through history, and hopefully ending up in the future. This, the journey starts with an idea. The idea is the current plan Mars One is developing. One thing that many modern innovators agree on are milestones. Ambitious milestones. One of these uh, modern innovators is Elon Musk, the founder of SpaceX, currently uh, the only private company to send rockets to the, the International Space Station. Obviously, they don't send the whole rockets up there, but they use the rockets to launch the spacecrafts which supply the International Space Station. The Mars One milestones are very ambitious. They've already slipped more than once. But if you want to make use of ambitious milestones, that's a risk you're going to have to accept. The first ambitious milestone Mars One hopes to achieve is in 2020. They want to land a um, technology demonstration mission on the surface of Mars. Uh, the purpose of this demonstration mission is to demonstrate some pretty basic but hugely important technological feats. This is, for instance, how much energy you can squeeze out of thin, flexible solar cells and also how you can use that energy to extract the water from the soil of Mars and turn that water into hydrogen and oxygen. In this equation, we have water and we have oxygen, two things that are hugely important for human life, especially on Mars. Then in 2022, they plan to send a rover to Mars. Rover is a robotic car of a kind. Um, NASA already has rovers on Mars, but this rover will be different from the NASA rovers. The purpose of this rover is, one, to find a suitable spot for a Mars settlement, and two, to, uh, in the long run, to haul things. It'll be a strong, fast workhorse instead of a slow, meticulous, precise scientist as the ones we have on Mars today. Then, in 2024, this is where the business happens. They plan to send as, as few as six cargo missions, probably more, on the uh, heaviest rockets available at that time. Once these cargo pods arrive at Mars, they will home in on the signal emitted by the rover and will try to land near it. Landing on Mars is difficult, so they will likely not land right on top of the rover. The rover will probably have to uh, fetch each single pod and move them closer to each other, where after they can be hastily assembled into a functioning base, which may not be ready to uh, harbor any uh, settlers, but it'll be uh, ready to extract water from the soil on Mars. And actually, soil is the wrong word, because Mars is a very fancy planet, for those of you that don't know. The ground there, it doesn't like to be called ground. Not soil, not dirt. It's regolith. Well, la di da <laughs> Once that has been done, uh, the base will be ready for humans. So in 2026, four astronauts will be sent in orbit for around Earth and then sent towards Mars. The journey will take uh, between six to nine months, at that time likely seven months. 
seven months where the astronauts will have little to do, little to occupy their hands, little to occupy their minds. That is, until they arrive on Mars, where they will have to, much like the first settlers on Earth, will have to establish their own society, only without the help of friendly natives. When we imagine our own future, humanity's future on another planet, or when we see it on TV, often we're surrounded by plastic and glass and blinking lights and hovering holograms, having fancy food served to us by robotic servants. I see life on Mars slightly different. Much as the first settlers in, on the new world, in the new world here on Earth had to build their own houses, tend their fields to have something to eat, so too do I imagine that the first Martian settlers will have to take care of their habitats, their houses. They will have to make sure that the, there's no dust on the surface of their solar cells, otherwise solar cells don't produce much energy. And they will have to cultivate their own food in the form of uh, vegetables and mealworms, such as these little guys here on the left. Often considered a stark contrast to the promises of tomorrow, the world of today can seem boring sometimes even as moving in the wrong direction. If any of you have been following the human endeavors in space, my bet is that you have been feeling like this in the run of the last four years, maybe even as long as the last 40 years. After the space race ended in the early 70s, humans have looked to the skies and expected more. At that time, already after the end of the Apollo space program, moon program, sorry, just to make sure where it, where it ended up, um, plans were already being drawn for a basis on the Moon and bases on Mars. The near-infinite resources of the solar system seemed ever so slightly out of our reach. From the beginnings uh, of human spaceflight, there's been a lot of vehicles to take us to space. Starting with, with the Russian Vostok, which carried uh, Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, into space. Later came the Americans' answer to that, the Mercury. And after that, a quick succession of mostly American and Russian spacecrafts, peaking with the lunar lander module, which carried humans to the moon, launched atop the mighty Saturn V rocket, a rocket so large its like hasn't been seen since. After that, the pace slowed down a little bit with the uh, space shuttle. It slowed down slowly, but uh, once arriving in 2011, it slowed to an all-time low, when the space shuttle was retired, and all we had left to go into space was the Soyuz, which is here on the right. It was designed in the 60s, and its Chinese derivative, the Shenzhou, on the left. That's all we have today to take us into space. So looking up at the sky today, you may be excused to think that the era of human spaceflight is coming to a halt. However, I don't think it's coming to a halt. I merely think we're in a transition phase. I think human spaceflight is transforming. And one of the major reasons I think that are the national space agencies such as NASA, whoever I imagine everyone knows, and ESA, the European Space Agency. What they're doing is they're trying to hand off the boring and routine parts of space travel. And yes, I do indeed think there will be boring and routine parts of space travel. This is the, uh, the transportation of cargo and uh, humans to the International Space Station. And they do this in order to free up their dwindling budgets uh, for more important things, for inventing things, for trailblazing, for creating things like the uh, Orion space capsule, which is intended to take people further and which is not yet profitable. In doing that, they're handing off the routine parts to private enterprise, the parts which can be, pr can be um, profitable. That is done today by SpaceX and Boeing, respectively, with their Dragon and Starliner capsule, both intended to take cargo and humans into space as a commodity, not as a curiosity. And it doesn't have to end there. There are further plans in the making. SpaceX, as, a, as late as this Tuesday, unveiled their new plans for a Mars colony infrastructure, taking as many as 100 people at a time to Mars. So who knows, in 20 or 30 years, maybe you guys can come to visit me. So some of you might ask, why are we, as, as a race, as a society, why are we going to space? And I think that's a fair question, because space can be very far away for some of us. It's not part of our everyday lives. So 
with all the resources we put into rockets and satellites, what do we get in return? A 2014 estimate showed that the return of an, on investment, the, in, the return of monetary value on an investment of hard cash made into space activities is between 7 and 14 times the initial investment. That's 700 to 1,400 percent. Two very important parts of this equation are GPS satellites and weather satellites, both of which are very important and very valuable to human society. Then why Mars? Why would you set up a non-profit organization to take people to Mars? That's a very different question with very different answers. To me, it's all about the uh, technological progress. And one thing we can expect from a Mars colony is sustainability and recycling technology. Because on Mars, everything is valuable. If you have something, if there's something you need on Mars, there's two ways you can get it. You can make it yourself on Mars, or you can get it from Earth. Getting it from Earth is very, very expensive. So you want to get, get as many things as you can locally. This includes recycling, this includes conserving energy, and that's something we can learn from here on Earth. We use a lot of resources we don't really have because we see them as, an, as infinite, even though they're not. And another thing, another reason for colonizing Mars could be the very preservation of the human species. Many very clever people, Stephen Hawking's among them, express concern that we as a species inhabit only one planet. A single planet-scale catastrophe could wipe us all out. That could be the explosion of a supervolcano. That could be the impact of one of the asteroids that we don't know about. We know about many asteroids, but not them all. We're routinely surprised by that. Or it could be the irrevocable alteration of our environment, like, for instance, global warming. If we had a colony on another planet, we would have a backup of Earth. And this is not just paranoid, paranoid speculation. Depending on which definition you use, scientists believe that the Earth has experienced up to 26 extinction events. 26. It's almost assured that it will happen again. We don't know when. So why would you do this such a thing? Why would you go to Mars and why would you do it one way? My personal motivation rests by far in the Apollo space program. In the wake of that program, we saw leaps and bounds in technology here on Earth. Not just space-related, but also very, very Earth-born. Down-to-Earth, very grounded. And another thing which I think is very important is motivation. If you have a group of people and you present them with a difficult technical challenge, at least one of them is sure to utter, hey, we put a man on the moon, we can do this. And that's the kind of attitude I want to foster. For there's just one certain way to fail, and that's not to try. What I'm asking for here, I'm not asking for everyone to do the same thing that the prospective colonists would do. I'm not asking anyone to follow in their footsteps. I'm asking you just to accept that someone would do this. I'm asking you to very seriously consider the pros and cons of something like this, of a mission like this. Not just for the people involved, because most of them have already made up their minds. But I'm asking you to consider the impacts on society as a whole. I'm asking you to accept this the same way that you would accept that someone else has a different religion or different sexual orientation from yours. I'll leave it up to you to uh, decide whether you think space travel can take over as the new driver of progress, taking over from wars, doing with curiosity what we have traditionally done with aggression. If you do think it, it can, there are two seeds I like to plant in your minds. The first one is a picture. First time painted by renowned aerospace engineer Robert Subrin, a veteran of many Mars planning missions. It's a picture of an interplanetary economy. Imagine a triangle. In one corner you have the Earth with this high-tech uh, production machinery or factories that have been many hundred years in the making. In the other corner, you have Mars, a place where humans can survive, a place with a smaller gravity well than Earth's. If you want to go to the moon and back again, the cost of energy, or as we measure it in space emissions, fuel, two-thirds of the fuel you spend on a mission like that is, uh, is burned getting from the surface of the Earth 
to Earth orbit. Mars has a much uh, weaker gravity, so you can get to places cheaper from there. Which brings us to the third part of our trade triangle, which is the asteroids. The asteroids of our solar system are a near indistinguishable pool of resources. There are precious metals, and there's lots and lots and lots of resources that we can use on Earth. But it's not a nice place to be for humans. There's no gravity, there's no atmosphere, there's no uh, magnetic field to protect us from radiation. But what could be done is you could use self-replicating asteroid miners to get these resources. By and far, a lot of these things, the drills, the chassis, could be made on Mars. Mars has resources we can use. And there are important things like the brains of these machines that couldn't be made on Mars. It's unlikely that we will have the microprocessors will be able to make those in, on Mars in any near future. That's very complex, even here on Earth. But these don't weigh so much. They could be sent from Earth. So you could have high-tech machinery sent from Earth. You could have drills and chassis made on Mars, launched from Mars, because Mars has a, a lower gravity, sent to the asteroids, get all these resources, send them back to Earth. And you have a beautiful trade triangle, similar to, but not not identical to the trade triangle of the uh, colonial period. That's one thing. Another thing I would like to, the other seed I'd like to plant in your minds is something you've probably heard before. But I'm hoping it will resonate with you a little louder coming from one of only 100 people on the planet who may be part of a, of a Mars colony in as little as 10 years. That point is reaching for the stars. Motivation. If there's something you truly believe in, if there's something you are convinced will make the world a better place, don't be afraid to aim for the moon, only to fall short of your goal. If you do so, maybe someone else will see your enthusiasm, your dedication, and you will have changed the world in a very small way, but you will have changed the world. And maybe, just maybe, that person will be inspired by your action and take up the mantle and do what you couldn't achieve in your lifetime. So maybe your goal won't be reached by you, but by someone else. But in the end, does that really matter? Thank you.